invitational poll of the local church is for insiders. And insiders are those people who just seem like they've got it all figured out. Have you ever been to a church where it just seems like everybody's life has fallen into place? Their kids don't argue, they love their jobs, and they have great key relationships. And you secretly hope that one day your life will be like that? Well, I have great news for you. We want to be a church that is not for insiders, a church that's not for people who have it all figured out. Because honestly, none of us do. And that's what Jerry's going to be talking about right now. <music> All right, good morning. Make sure we're all on here. Um, that song when um, every time that line that says, all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. That gets me every time. I'm back there in the back singing. I always have to stop and cry for a little bit, you know, because it's just one of those things. I mean, I, um, you know, of all the times in my life that I've been unfaithful to God and he's always been faithful to me. Always been faithful. We're talking about the prodigal son and, you know, the kid's ready to go home and the dad's already waiting on him. Already waiting on him and I told someone this week, I wrote something, I think, I think on Facebook, I think I wrote something along the line of, I've given God a million reasons to not love me, but he does anyway. So, much to be thankful for. So, for the last couple of weeks, as I said, we've been talking of probably Jesus' most famous story, a story of a guy who had two sons, and we've talked about, I challenge you to pray every day, God help me to see other people in the same way that you see people and help us as a church to see our community in the same way that you see our community. And, and last week we talked about um, being a church that uh, treats people the way that God treated us. The Bible says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that sometimes we get a little full of ourselves and we think we're better than other people and need to be reminded it was while we were sinners that he died for us not while we had anything good to, to bring him. And so um, today it's, it's just us, okay, you in the room. We had a good crowd in the early service, and um, we, it's interesting. I have to remind people of this every once in a while because some people, we, sometimes we tend to think of the size of our church as just the people uh, that are here. Uh, typically on a, when uh, Jen or myself or Jess gets up on Sunday and we do that little welcome, uh, that's kind of inviting about three or 400 other people uh, that are watching online, uh, not just in our area. Uh, so it kind of joins the two congregations, if you will, and we've become um, one good-sized congregation. We've heard now, uh, since we've been broadcasting live, we've heard from people in, um, I think, uh, 27 different states. Um, and we chart everything. We're able to tell not who is, but how many are. And so on any given Sunday, even as you're sitting here right now, there's several hundred other people that are watching, so that's why during a service I'll say you who are here or, or, or you who are uh, watching. Um, I, I just think that's crazy and amazing and, uh, you know, that all of this has just happened in the last three years or so. But if you consider Atlantic Coast your church, either physically or remotely, um, I'm glad you're here today because I'm going to talk about us today. If you don't consider Atlantic Coast your church, um, again, you could not have picked a better day. Uh, to be here or to be tuning in, because today's the day I'm going to be talking about what it is that we do. And, uh, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, because uh, some of you may have figured out already, we may be just a little bit different from what you are used to when you think about church, and if you're from a different faith tradition. Uh, and I was trying to figure out last night, and I just lost track of how many people I know in our, service, in our church who you know, used to be this, used to be this, used to be this, you know, with all the different denominations. So we have people from all different faith traditions. Uh, maybe you're here or you're watching and you, you come really from no faith tradition. You're just kind of experimenting. You're just kind of checking us out. Or you, maybe you used to be a church person, but because of something that happened or what someone said or did, you don't consider yourself a church person anymore. I want you to know that part of the way, part of the reason why we do things the way that we do them here is for someone like you. 
okay? Or from someone, for someone that you care about, that that's their story. And so today I want to pull back the curtain a little bit. It's like I said, it's going to be a two-week series, so we're going to kind of stop in the middle here. Uh, pull back the curtain and talk about why we do things the way we do. It's not a secret. Um, I love our church. Uh, been here a long time now. Uh, I'm proud of the way that we're doing things. Uh, I honestly think we're the best church in the area. Don't tell anybody that. We have a lot of good churches in the area, a lot of good pastors. I think we're the best. Um, and um, I like going here. I would go here even if I wasn't the pastor. Uh, and by the way, not many pastors can say that. So, um, and there was a time when I couldn't. But, uh, but anyway, um, I get um, every once in a while, I, I get, you know, some feedback that, that's kind of negative. And, uh, and every once in a while, you know, it's a lot of it's from outside. But every once in a while, some of you are a little uneasy about our philosophy or they don't understand. And, and so I get that. And so periodically, I do what we're going to do today. And, and next, we can kind of go uh, let you know why we do what we do. And remember, you can always ask questions, okay? Um, just wait till the end of the message, if you will. So, all right, so we have a saying around here. Uh, it's not original with us. We like to say that following Jesus makes your life better, and it makes you better at life. And when I say that, that doesn't mean that we think we're better than anyone else. It just means that we think that we're better off now that we are following Jesus. We're better off now than we were before we started following Jesus because it has made our life better. Not necessarily easier, okay? Life is what it is, but it's made it better. And my own personal testimony is following Jesus. And there was a time in my life when I wasn't following Jesus, as I should. But following Jesus, I think, has made me a much better husband. I think it's made me a better father and grandfather. And I think following Jesus, if you're someone who has people who work for you, it makes you a better employer. If you work for someone else, it makes you better employees. It makes us better citizens. I think following Jesus can make you a better next door neighbor. I mean, around here, we just believe that following Jesus has made our life better and makes us better at life. So knowing that about us, it should come <coughs> as no surprise to know that the mission, the agenda of Atlantic Coast Church is very simple. It's to inspire people to follow Jesus. It's inspire the people to find what we found. Because we believe that when a person begins to follow Jesus, even if they're not convinced of everything that we're convinced about, that just beginning to follow the teachings of Jesus, you'll be better off. If you follow the teachings of Jesus, you'll learn how to forgive. You'll learn how, to, how interpersonal dynamics can work better. It'll teach you how to maybe raise your kids uh, with a little more wisdom and, and your marriage with a little more wisdom. Help you kind of clean out your heart of all the junk that gets accumulated in our heart. And maybe, just maybe, you'll begin to see other people the way that God sees them. So that's our agenda, and that's our mission, to inspire people to follow Jesus. But if that's the case, and here's why I want to talk to just us today, if that's the case, if our mission is to inspire people to follow Jesus, that means that we have to be inspiring. <laughs> and I said in the first service, everyone went, oh, no, <laughs> you know, that we have to be inspiring personally. Okay, at home and at work and in our community and certainly when we come together like this on Sunday. Um, I believe that our community needs a church like ours. A church that's what I call and has just said, that, a church that's outward facing. A church that has unchurched and, and people who aren't even interested in Jesus, right? We have them in mind. We believe that Jesus was an outward facing person. And we know as we read the stories in the Bible that people who were nothing like Jesus really liked Jesus. And he liked them back. And we want people who are not necessarily like us in our community to like us. And we, they will come to like us as we take on the tone and the posture and the approach of our Savior. And we will have some people who will come, as some have, and, and walk away. And they may not believe, but I think they ought to walk away believing that we believe what we say we believe, all right? We want to be that kind of church. But here's the challenge. Jess talked about this. The gravitational pull of most local churches is inward. It's always inward. Um, so I'm going to use some New Testament language today that you may not be familiar with. The, when I say the insider, the insider is that person that, that kind of has it all figured out. And like she said, maybe you've walked into a service as I have, and you kind of looked around and looked like everybody had their act together. 
you know, and, and the, you know, the, their kids got along and their life was wrinkle free. And, and you just sit there and hope, well, maybe one day, maybe one day my life will be like that. And we want our church to be a church for people that are looking for that. People just like that. We want to have a church where people who have questions, where people who have doubts, where, where people say, hey, Jerry, my life is, is kind of a mess. Is it okay if I come and see what it really means to follow Jesus? even with all of my questions and my doubts and my messy life. And I love to smile and say, absolutely, you're welcome here. And if you're one of those people who began coming to church here, or you've begun watching us online each week because we are an outward-facing church, and you've made the decision to follow Jesus in your life, if I was to talk to you, you would say, I'm so grateful for a church that's not just about the insiders. Because we've been, we or my family or myself, we've been introduced to real faith here. Or maybe you've seen someone whose life has been changed because of the ministry of this church. And, and you would say, I'm so grateful that we are an outward-facing church. And not just about Christians, but we're about outsiders and insiders. Or maybe this, and this is important. Maybe you have a friend. Maybe you have a family member who has questions, who has doubts. They have a messy life right now. But right now, you would sit here and you would say, I'm so glad that I have a church that I can invite this person to. I can invite this person to. At the same time, there's this constant pull on the church, constant. The older a church gets, the more it tends to gravitate towards everybody kind of turning their back on the culture and just turning in. Who goes to your church? Well, me and my friends. Me and my friends and the people that I like. And listen, I've been in those churches. You don't want to be a part of a church like that, all right? I don't want to be a part of that kind of church. And the people who are responsible for ensuring that we don't become that is all of us. It's not just me. It's not just the leadership team. It's not the, the, the ones that are handling all of our children's and youth ministries right now. It's not just the band. It's not just the staff. It's all of us. So like I said, I want us to kind of just talk about us for a while today. We'll carry it over in the next week. I'll also tell you this. Our decision, if you say, well, that's the kind of church I want... If, if we make the decision or our decision to be this kind of church is not always met with universal approval. Believe it or not, you can't make everybody happy. You ever figure that out? My dad told me that if you try to make everybody happy, you don't make anybody happy. And, and it is so true in church. And, and, you know, I hear it. The preacher doesn't dress like a preacher. I always laugh at that. I wonder what preachers dress like. I've been in churches where th th there's robes and there's collars and there's suits and ties and Jesus wore a robe and flip-flops or sandals, I guess, um, you know, so I don't know, that's, that's always one I enjoy. Um, the music is not reverent enough, they don't do an altar call, they don't do communion enough. Uh, my two favorite criticisms, I actually received a note, and I get them periodically, received a note in the offering box a few months ago. Now, I'll tell you something ahead of time, typically, if you're passionate enough about something to write me a note and, and put it in the offering box, uh, sign it. Okay? Be happy to get with you. Um, when I get one, and again, it's just periodically, maybe once every six months or so, but I'll, uh, and, and most time it's from a, a guest, not one of our people, but uh, this one uh, wrote it, and typically if I get one, the first thing I do, I realize what's coming, so I look at the end, and I want to see who it's from first. If it's not signed, I'll be honest with you, I throw it away. I do not even read it. Okay? If you're passionate about something, the Bible says the way we handle that is we go to each other. And we talk about it. So if you're not even willing to do that, I'm not willing to waste my time reading your eight-page letter, okay? Um, and this one was about six or seven pages, as I remember. Um, but so it wasn't signed. It was from someone who admittedly said, I've only attended a few weeks. I think I said six weeks in the early service. And, but somehow in that time, they figured us out. Us, okay? And they figured me out, and they figured my motives out and why we're doing, and they figured this church and its missions out. And, and, and by the way, some of these things they're going to say, there could be some legitimacy to some of it. And you might even feel a little uneasy about it, but that's fine, okay? Because you keep attending, and you, you keep talking, and you keep the conversation going. Here was the first one that really bothered them. Everybody, everybody at your church seems to be happy. <laughs> I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> and here was their reasoning. They said... It seems like everything's going well. You must be doing something wrong. 
So they were like, maybe some of you and maybe me and part of my life in a church where if there wasn't conflict, you didn't think you were at church. You know, there was always one group against another group or somebody was upset with somebody else. And, and I always wonder why those people keep coming to the same church. You know, just leave one of you and make, make both of you happy. But, but anyway, because everything was nice and going well, then we seemed to be happy. And we must be doing something wrong. The other one, I'll spend a little time with this one, is this. Um, they're not very deep. They're not very deep. The preaching is not deep. The, you know, the music is not deep, whatever. Um, and, and I will say this, and I don't mean to be unkind because I'll explain what I'm going to say here in just a minute. If you really want deep, deep, deep teaching, honestly, you're going to need to go somewhere else. Okay? And, and I don't mean to be that unkind. And let me talk about it a little bit. I think you'll understand why I say it the way I do. And I wanted to find deep at the beginning because apparently this person did not know what deep meant. Okay? Deep means that you cannot touch bottom. Right? You get in a pool and you're in the shallow end and you can touch bottom and your feet and you're very comfortable and you move further out and you get to deep end. And what happens? You can't touch bottom anymore. You have to paddle, right, to stay up. You have to kick your feet. You have to hold on to the side because you are in the deep end of the pool. All right. So, so just to clarify, th there's, I'm saying today, my premise is there's no such thing as deep teaching or deeper teaching. I think that's a Christian myth. I think there is confusing teaching. That masquerades is deep teaching. A couple weeks ago, my wife and I went for four days. We went up to Charleston, South Carolina, and there was a pastor's conference. And it's a group that I had not been affiliated with before, didn't know anything about them. And, and so I went, and uh, I got into the second speaker, and my wife was back at the hotel room. And I texted her, and I said, this is deep. <laughs> and she said, well, what's he said? I go, I don't understand anything he said. <laughs> I mean, he's using words that I didn't know, and, and I'm not used to a guy, nothing against robes and collar. I mean, and that was part of their church tradition. That was fine and everything. But what he was saying, and, I, and I'm a pretty good listener, you know, and I'm kind of well-read, and you know, I'm just, you know, really kind of, I'm trying to take notes, and, and, and nothing's happening. And it's kind of like two guys, you know, they, we'd walk out and say, that was deep. So yeah, what did he say? He said, I don't know. I, I, don't, under, I don't understand it. Um, I don't know what to do with it, but boy, it was deep. <laughs> it was so good. And I've walked out of church services where I've said, oh, that was so good. And everybody said, what was that? I, go, I don't know, but it was good because it was, it was deep and I didn't understand it. So it must have been deep. So let me throw something up on the screen for you here and um, go ahead and put the next slide up. All right. So, so the New Testament was written in, in Greek. Okay. Um, I studied Greek in college. In order to graduate from college, I had to translate entire chapters from Greek to English. Here are some Greek words, okay? That's some Greek words. Um, I can read that because <laughs> I went to college, okay, to study that. And so I can go deep. And it says... Well, actually, I just had Jen type up some letters and put them all on there. I have no idea what that says. <laughs> but it's deep, isn't it? Because it's Greek. <laughs> and that's the language that the Bible was first written in. Um, I have no idea what that says. I'll have to ask Jen. Um, probably something about me. <laughs> and um, make it funny. But anyway, so, so just to clarify... What I'm saying is there's no such thing as deep teaching. There is only deep application. Deep application. And this is what you find in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And this is what you find the Apostle Paul talking about. Jesus, the Apostle Paul, constantly talks about hearing, then doing, and applying. Hearing, doing, and applying, not just hearing. All right? Not just hearing. And this is, this is why we talk about it all the time here, that it's doing and applying what we're hearing that makes the difference. Not just hearing it. It's why Jesus said this in Matthew 7. He said, anyone who hears these words of mine and writes them in a notebook. No, Jesus didn't say that. That's why he said, anyone who hears these words of mine and posts them on their Facebook or Instagram page. No, that's not what Jesus said. Here's what he said. He said, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
And you know the story, a foundation that would not shift regardless of the storms that life brings. So church, it's doing that makes the difference. Not just learning, not just teaching, not just note taking, not taking in more and more and more and more Christian information. I grew up in those churches, all right? And I'm just telling you, and the best way I can describe it is this, unapplied truth is like unapplied paint. Okay, you're going to paint your house and you can buy all the paint and all the supplies that you want and you can set it in your garage and your house will not change. Nothing will happen until you open that paint can and you apply that paint. That's what paint is for. And applying the teaching of Jesus is what makes a person deep. And it's what changes people's lives. And, and Jesus comes and he talks, he talks about love, but then he demonstrated love. And he even showed that pure love was going to be costly. Costly. Paul comes along and says there's all these interesting things going on. in the, There's gifts of the Spirit. There's all of these kinds of things. He says there's faith, hope, and love. He said, but the greatest of these is love. And he talked in each book of how to apply that love to their specific situation. And John, who wrote the book of John, and then the three books at the back, and then Revelation, he spent three and a half years with Jesus, and I like to say he looked love in the eyes every day. And he concluded that God is love. So the deepest thing on planet Earth, then, is love. And the deepest expression of the deepest thing on planet Earth is sacrificial love. And listen to me. Sacrificial love is as deep as you will ever go. You can't go beyond that. I don't know why we make it so hard. It's not confusing. It's not difficult. But here's what I have learned as pastor of this church for these years. There's no such thing as deep teaching, but there are deep Christians. There are deep Christians. And you've met some of these people. And when you meet them and know them, they amaze you. And some of you are these people to me. If you were to sit back behind a curtain and hear how I describe some of your lives and where you were and where you are now and as you've begun applying the, the truth of Jesus and his sacrificial love to your life, you wouldn't even notice yourself, but other people notice. Other people notice. And, and, and one of the things I love most about our church is when I am out and I hear stories of people doing extraordinary things. A couple times a year, I usually remind you this, invariably I'll be somewhere and I don't like to be recognized as a pastor. I want people to think I'm at least a little bit normal for a while, you know, so they don't have this preconceived notion, but someone will come up to me and they'll, they'll find out I'm already pastor. I say Atlantic coast. Oh, does so, doesn't so-and-so go to your church? And I always ask why? <laughs> Cause if it's bad, I'll say, I don't know who they are. I have no idea. <laughs> Never seen them before in my life. That usually doesn't happen. What usually happens is what I heard this week. Someone say, that person models Jesus like I think Jesus ought to be modeled. I had someone say after the first service, and I'm not, I'm not giving away a secret, but this person has friends who are actually actively involved in witchcraft. And this person comes to our church and loves her friends and lets them know that what they're doing is wrong because of what Jesus has done for them. And she came up to me today and she said, one of my friends this week said that the Jesus that you talk about is the Jesus that I need to find. Okay? Now, can I tell you something? That's deep. That's what deep is. Okay? That's what deep. Deep Christians, they, they amaze us. And when I hear stories of people in our church making extraordinary sacrifices on behalf of other people with their generosity. You know, some people that just give, I, they give, and I'm like, how do they have any money left? Because they just give, and every time we have an opportunity, here's a new opportunity, here, I'll give. They give of their generosity, they give with their time, with their patience, with their love, with hanging out. We've got adults that are hanging out with our elementary and our middle school kids over in the other building and our babies and all of this and uh, getting involved in doing that, getting involved in serving their neighbors. And, 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 and when you do that, you change lives. And, and they're literally saving lives and seeing lives change. And it doesn't get any deeper than that, guys. And, and I don't, again, I don't mean to sound unkind, but I don't care if you can recite all of the books from the Old Testament in order. 
Some of you say, I had no way I'd ever be able to do that. So what? What does that do for someone who needs Jesus? You're deep because you've gone out into the deep end where you can't touch bottom. And you know, if God doesn't come through, I'm going to drown. That's what a deep Christian is. So here's what I want you to get today, okay? And I'll post this on Facebook this week so you don't have to write all of this down. A deep Christian is someone who will wade out into the deep water of sacrificial application where they will not survive without God's help. And let me tell you one of the things I pray as a pastor. And I pray for our church and I pray for all of our ministries and all the things we're doing. And I, I realize that probably 90% of what most churches do, they could do even if God didn't show up. We're that good. We can program lessons. We can program curriculum. We can schedule stuff. I get that. I just pray that stuff happens around here that we all just back off and say that was God. We're not that good. That was a God thing. And, and when we see those, to be very, very aware of them. All right? So the ones who wade out into the deep water of sacrificial application where they won't survive without God's help. And some people say that's not so deep. But listen, deep is not the issue. The issue is, is it clear? The issue is, is it convicting? Or would you rather hear a bunch of words you don't understand? Or would you just simply begin to do what Jesus has told you to do very clearly? All right? Because Jesus is going to lead you and I to do some things, and our church to do some things that will make us uncomfortable. Okay? Um, I've tried to challenge you around here, and get, I'll challenge you again. Getting involved in a class, a local ministry, helping with some of our kids' ministry, getting food for people, cleaning a building, knowing your neighbors, serving your neighbors, Start giving financially. If you're already giving, increase your giving. Someone said double, you give. Listen, let me, let me tell you how this deep works. And I'll just use this as an example because I know this doesn't bother you when I talk about money. I know, I know some people get nervous. I had a lady one time call me on a Saturday. She said, hey, our next door neighbors are coming to church for the first time. And I said, great. You're not going to be talking about money, are you? <laughs> well, you go to the grocery store, they talk about money. And you go... Movies, they talk, you know, everybody talks about money. Yeah, well, you know, we might, it might not be the focus. But, but so every couple years or so, we do a, a series on generosity and what it looks like. And we got one coming up this year, so y'all can get nervous about it. And, but if I, what, what if I got up here and I preached a sermon and I said, everybody in here, you need to increase your giving. And I had several points and an illustration and a joke that made you laugh. But I said, you need to increase your giving. Okay? In fact, I said, if you really want to be right with God, you should double your giving. Now, I don't believe that. I'm just saying as an illustration. You know what most of us would do? We would begin to back up out of the deep end and get into the shallow end, wouldn't we? And we'd say, oh, oh, oh no, uh, <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> I, I don't need to, I don't need to um, have someone help me touch bottom. I can touch it myself. I don't need to do that, all right? Listen, someone challenges you to do something that stretches your faith, that's an invitation to step into the deep end, to step into that place where God has to come through or else you're going to drown. And I want you to know that if you're serious about following Jesus, every once in a while in your life, as you walk through this life with God, every once in a while, the Holy Spirit that's in you as a Christian is going to urge you to step into the deep end and to do something sacrificial and to do something unusual. And your resistance in that moment and my resistance in that moment is make or break as to how deep we're really going to go as, as Christians. And, and you cannot substitute that kind of obedience and that kind of fellowship with just more information. Well, I'm not going to do all that, but I'll go to another Bible study or I'll do this or I'll, you know, more devotion, something like that. I want to challenge you today. Do something that stretches you. Do something that stretches you, okay? And we're going to talk about this more next week. God's going to call you to do something that stretches your faith. That always happens, okay? And when he does, that's deep. That's deep. It's not about teaching. It's not about information. It's not about application. So, so, so the Greek words, again, that we had up on the screen, all right? That's not deep. That's just Greek. <laughs> it's all it is. You can't read it. I can't read it anymore, all right? In fact, can I be honest with you? That's not even real Greek. We just kind of found some Greek letters and we typed them in a series of things. That, that's not even real Greek. That's fake Greek right now. All right? And, and you would not know that. And because of that, I could say, well, this means this. And you go, wow, that's amazing. He's so deep. You know? But that's not deep. 
The, the gifts of the Spirit that we talk about, love, joy, peace, all those things. Listen, that's good, but that's not deep. Here, here it is. God gifted every single one of his followers with gifts, talents, and abilities. Not so you can play in the shallow end and say, look at my gift, but so that you can step out into the deep end and use those things that God has given you where you have to trust God and maybe pray like you never have before, and you use those gifts to serve other people. That's sacrificial love. And let me tell you what I found. Those are the kind of people that are attracted to this church. And that's some of you. And as your pastor, it's amazing to hear the stories. And you think it's not a big deal, but it's a huge deal. I remember I, would see, I had a grandparent. We grew up in Miami, and I had a grandparent in Atlanta. And we'd go see them every two or three years. And first thing my grandmother would say when I would get out of the car is, my, how you've grown. And I always kind of put my head down because I didn't think I had grown. But other people noticed I had grown. And sometimes you don't know. But I know. And your neighbors know. And your church family knows. And your coworkers know. And it's amazing to hear, not, again, not what you have learned, but what you have done in response to the call of God in your life. So let me wrap this up in a couple minutes, all right? So we want our church to be deep. And when I say deep now, I mean I want us to be theologically grounded I want us to be true to the words of God. I want us to be grounded and anchored to the resurrection of Jesus. The anchor of our faith is not the entire Bible. Let me, people always get nervous when I say that. Listen, the anchor of our faith, how we know this faith is real, was an event. It was the resurrection of Jesus Christ because something happened in history that causes us to believe that Jesus is exactly who he said he was. He said he was going to come back to life when he died. If he hadn't done that, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't need to be here today. But because we believe that, that's exactly who he said he was, and we believe that he's the son of God. I say it like this. I say we are Christians today because of an event that, caught, that um, started a movement, the church, that produced and preserved reliable documents. That's how we got our Bible, okay? And, and we want to be anchored in that. And, and it causes us to take the teaching of Jesus seriously because, again, if a guy says he's going to come back from the dead and he does, you kind of believe everything else he says, all right? And, and, and from here, we have, then you have the Apostle Paul, and he writes to all these churches, here's how to apply the truth of what Jesus taught. And we have the Old Testament that tells us the story of Jesus in prophecy and all of the story leading up to it. So we want to be deep. We want to be anchored in Jesus and the teaching of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. And then we want to actually do what Jesus told us to do. All right? And that allows us to be deep. And here's where I want to go next week. I want us to be wide. Some of you grew up in Sunday school and you remember that little song, Deep and Wide? Okay? I want us to be wide. And we'll talk about that next week. I want us to be as stretched out as we can be to stretch out this thing of the love of Jesus just as far as we can. I love it, Christmas story, because the angels, remember what the angels said? They said the coming of Jesus is good news of great joy to all the people. Not just to church people. They didn't even have a church back then, okay? Not just to, um, you know, the people who were, you know, very devout. No, to all people. And so Jesus then comes along and he tells us to go into all the world, to every generation, every culture, every person, every mess with the good news of Jesus. So we want to be deep in terms of what we are anchored to and our own personal application. And we want to spread a message that's as wide as the whole world. And we'll talk about that next week. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Father, I'm thankful for your goodness. And that's what we're talking about even in all of this. You have been so good to us. And you ask us to be good to other people for you so that they'll find you. So God, we're thankful for your goodness. We're thankful for your patience. I'm thankful that all my life you've been faithful. That you will never let me go. And God, with all of the junk and the the baggage that this world is carrying around, that's a message that everyone needs to hear. That there is one who loves them. That there is one who loves them so much that he was willing to give his only begotten son to die for them and forgive their sins. And to prepare a better place for us beyond this.
So God, we are so, so thankful for you today, for your Holy Spirit, for Jesus. We pray this in his name. Everyone said, amen.